Hey everybody, Mr. Troy here. No time to waste, let's get right to it. It's time for math with Mr. Troy. I think that song means it's quadratic formula day. Okay, here we go. Now, uh, just a note, now that we know about imaginary numbers, we're gonna solve over the complex numbers, which means the only time we're gonna say no solutions is if we're told, hey, just think about the real numbers. Okay, I'm sure you've already got the quadratic formula memorized. If, if you want me to press the button, play the song again, I can, but I, I'm sure we're good. With any quadratic, um, for the, about half of our methods, we need to make sure we're set equal to zero. So um, for this problem, we probably want to move everything to the left. Uh, it's nice for a to be positive. So we want our lead coefficient to be positive. So we start out by picking out our a, b, and c. And then we're going to plug into the formula. There are two things that I want you to think about when you plug into the formula. One of them is count the negative signs. You should think of this as negative four times three times negative two. Since there are two negative signs there, you're gonna end up adding. The other thing is that whatever you're squaring is gonna end up positive. So if you square negative four, it's gonna end up being positive 16. Same thing if you square positive four. Okay, so I'm sure you've done this before but we work through first by figuring out what the radicand is, what goes underneath the square root, and then we're going to simplify that. But we're gonna take a quick break because we're gonna learn about the discriminant, which is gonna make our life a ton easier. So the discriminant is the name for b squared minus 4ac. And it's gonna give us some really interesting information about solving this equation. The reason the discriminant is a thing that we care about is because it is the radicand. It's the thing underneath the square root, and taking the square root tells us something. If the discriminant is greater than zero, that means that our problem is going to have a plus or minus the square root of a positive in it. If the discriminant is less than zero, that means our problem is going to have a plus or minus the square root of a negative. And if our discriminant is zero, that means our problem is going to have a plus or minus the square root of zero. So we're gonna investigate in just a second what all of those things mean. Before we do that, just one handy tip. If the discriminant is a perfect square, so for example, something like this, where you have the square root of 36, that means that your problem could have been factored. So here's the reason for that. If you get a nice uh, number out of there, if you take the square root of a perfect square, you're going to get a rational number as your solution. In this case, you'd get two rational numbers as your solution. If you can get rational numbers, it means you could factor because the zeros are themselves the quotient of two integers. So when the discriminant is positive, we're going to simplify. And when we do that, what we're going to get are two real solutions, two different real solutions. In this case, our, answer, uh, our answers happen to be one-third plus root seven over six and one-third minus root seven over six. Now, if you see a graph that crosses the x-axis in two places, so either coming from above and crossing through the x-axis or coming from below and crossing through the x-axis, that tells you that your discriminant is a positive number because it has two solutions. The solution to the right of the vertex is generally going to be the one from when you have the plus part of it. 
and the one on the left is generally going to be the one from when you have the minus part of it. Uh, so that's not necessarily true, like if, for example, your denominator was negative, then it would be flip-flopped. But, uh, you know, that's a, a general rule of thumb that works for all positives. Okay, so this is going to be a problem where the discriminant is a negative number, where the discriminant is less than zero. Take a few seconds, um, see if you um, can figure out how to do this. Um, I'm sure some of you have, have done this a lot of times. Some of you may have even like uh, programmed this in, in Python or Java or whatever. I know the first computer program I ever built was, or ever wrote rather, was a uh, quadratic formula program in the eighth grade. So pause the video, see if you can plug this into the quadratic formula. Okay, so here it is plugged in. And now make sure you know how to evaluate it. Okay, here I get a negative radicand. My discriminant is negative. So for this reason, when my discriminant is negative, I'll be taking the square root of a negative number. And because of the plus or minus, I'm going to get two different imaginary solutions. So in this case, I'm gonna get x equals negative two plus or minus i. When you graph things that have a negative discriminant, they are either going to not hit the x-axis from above or not hit the x-axis from below. The reason they're not gonna hit the x-axis is because they don't have a real solution, so their solution won't show up on a graph, on a, a real coordinate plane. Finally, something like x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals 0 is going to have a, uh, a discriminant of 0. So before we look at using the quadratic formula on that, let's think about factoring it. Wouldn't it factor to x minus 3 times x minus 3 equals 0? So don't we kind of know just by looking at it that it only has one solution, and that solution is 3? You don't actually need to list it twice, by the way. So we haven't tested the discriminant yet, but what I'll tell you is that when the discriminant is 0, you have one real repeated solution. The reason we call it a repeated solution is because it's coming from two separate places. But you only need to list it once because this is answering the question, what numbers will make uh, the equation true? So let's plug this one into the quadratic formula and see why the discriminant does that. So when I plug it in, I'm gonna get 36 minus 36. That's where the zero comes from. Now think about adding or subtracting the square root of zero. It's nothing. So adding zero and subtracting zero doesn't do anything. So our answer is just six halves, which is, by the way, three. So if you know how to factor that, it's a little bit faster this way, but it helps us see what happens when the discriminant is zero. In cases like this, the graph is going to hit and bounce off the x-axis. It's gonna hit in one place and bounce off the x-axis. So this one would actually look something like this. It would actually have a y-intercept of nine, or it might come from underneath like this and hit and bounce off the x-axis. Okay, the next thing we're gonna go over is completing the square. This is one of the most daunting things um, that we end up having to do in Algebra 2. People really struggle with this at first, but once you know how to do it, it's a breeze, okay? So, um, we're gonna go over this a lot in class, but I'm just gonna show you one example in order to try and help, okay? Say I had this equation. Now normally we would never factor something that doesn't equal zero, but let's just factor the left side. Doesn't it factor to x plus six times x plus six? And there's no nine product property, so that's why we don't normally treat it this way. But 
if I think about it, now all of a sudden it's a square root problem. And from here I know where to go. Once we have a square root problem, they're really easy to work with. So our goal is going to be to take equations that don't look like this and manipulate them so they do. Let's take one quick example. So the key to all of this is memorizing the perfect square trinomial pattern. I would love for the left side of this equation to factor like this. Now, you might say, well, why x plus 1 times x plus 1? Why is it that you want to turn it into x plus 1 squared? Well, I already have 2x. And if I think about foiling this, I've got 2x there. So this is already x squared plus 2x. It just has this extra 1 here, the lasts. So it would be a lot easier if the left side of my equation was x squared plus 2x plus 1. But I can't just do whatever I want to an equation unless I also do it to the other side. So if I add 1 to the right side of the equation as well, now all of a sudden I have an equation that I can solve using the square root method. So the question for you to ponder as we go into class is, what constant term would I need to put in the blank in order to make this a perfect square trinomial? If you can figure that out, you've got the entire thing unlocked. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Um, here's some more theme music on the way out. Maestro. See ya.